Well, today on the show, we're looking at two approaches to solving the problem of God and evil. It's an age-old question. If God is all-powerful and entirely good and loving, why is there so much evil in the world? Two Christian thinkers both seeking to find answers to this question join me today, but with quite different theological approaches. John C. Peckham is Professor of Theology and Christian Philosophy at Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan. His latest book, Theodicy of Love, Cosmic Conflict and the Problem of Evil, suggests that God's love is at the centre of a cosmic drama that provides significant insights into the problem of evil. Thomas J. Ord is a theologian and philosopher, director of the Centre for Open and Relational Theology. Uh, His latest book, which is actually available for free on his website, is God Can't, How to Believe in God and Love After Tragedy, Abuse and Other Evils. But he's known for his alternative approach to the issue of how God acts in the world, which was set forth really in his 2015 book, The Uncontrolling Love of God. There he makes the case for what he calls the essential kenosis of God, that God is not in control of the physical world, but emphasizes God's inherently non-coercive love in relation to creation. I'll make sure there are links to both my guests from today's show as well. And I think we're in for a fascinating discussion today. Um, so first of all, um, both John and Thomas, welcome along to the program. Thank you, Justin. Good to be talking with you guys. It's great to have you both. Um, maybe we'll start with you, John. You were the instigator of this show, I think, in many ways. Um, uh, tell us um, a, a little of your background and why you started to write on the subject of the problem of evil. Yeah, I, I grew up as a PK, a pastor's kid. And for as long as I can remember, I, I was wrestling with the problem of evil, suffering, injustice in the world, uh, going into the city and doing uh, soup kitchens and other things. It really troubled me a great deal. So that is the the main reason that I ended up becoming a theologian, becoming a systematic theologian, because I uh, found it difficult to reconcile the kind and amount of evil that we see in this world with the fact that there is a loving God. Um, So this work, in many ways, it it brings to fruition a a lot of the goals (laughs) that I set out for a, a long time ago when I was very young. And as you've got to grips with that in a theological, philosophical way, have you had any major shifts in the way you've approached the problem of evil and suffering? I have had a lot of shifts, a lot of things that I have discovered uh, in wrestling with the problem that have helped me to think through it uh, quite a bit more. Um, I uh, very much appreciate uh, the free will defense of the kind that Alvin Plantinga has laid out that uh, free will of the kind that God does not determine, uh, God grants that kind of free will, the world is better with that kind of free will than it would be otherwise. I think it's better because I think love requires that kind of free will. But insofar as God grants that kind of free will, it's not up to him whether creatures use uh, that their, their free will to do evil. Sadly, creatures have used their free will to do evil, and that's why there is evil in the world, I believe. But do you take it obviously beyond that to some extent in this book? Um, because obviously the, the the way people use their free will is not the only way in which evil exists in the world. There is, as we call it, natural evil, earthquakes, um, disaster, uh, illness, disease and so on. And um, and a lot of people will say, yeah, well, the free will defense is one thing, but but why would God set up the world in such a way that all of these terrible evils can nevertheless befall people, apparently not from any kind of act of their own um, misuse of their free will. Yes, absolutely. Uh, That's one of the reasons I wrote the book, because there appear to be many kinds of evils. You mentioned some that it seems an omnipotent God could prevent without undermining anyone's free will. And so I think uh, we can be helped here by retrieving uh, the uh, motif of cosmic conflict, which is pervasive in scripture, also very well represented in the Christian tradition. And the cosmic conflict uh, says that there is a conflict between God's kingdom and a demonic realm, which consists of creatures who were created perfectly good, but fell of their own free volition and rebelled against God and are uh, involved in a conflict opposing God's kingdom. Of course, that raises another question immediately. How could there be any conflict between an omnipotent God and any creatures, the Mm. devil and his cohorts or anyone else. And there could only be a conflict if the conflict is not a conflict of sheer power, but a conflict of a different kind. 
And I think there is a good biblical reason to believe that the conflict is a conflict over God's character, a conflict caused by slanderous allegations raised by the devil against God's character and his government, which uh, the devil raised before a heavenly court. And those kinds of allegations against one's character cannot be settled by sheer power. There's no amount of power that a king could, could exert in order to prove to his subjects that he is good and loving. No amount of ex executive uh, power or action could prove to citizens that a mayor or president is not corrupt. If allegations of character have been raised, then this is an epistemic conflict, primarily a conflict about whether people believe that God is good, or whether creatures believe that God is good and loving. If the conflict is a conflict of that kind, in order for God to defeat those allegations, which defeating them is not only for his own sake, but for the sake of the entire universe, because if creatures don't fully trust God, they can't love God, and this is part of where uh, all of the kinds of disharmony comes from. The only way to defeat those kinds of allegations is for there to be some kind of a demonstration, a fair and open demonstration. In order for there to be that kind of demonstration, though, the enemy must be allowed to make his case within some consistent parameters. And I think there's a lot of evidence that there are such consistent parameters operating in this world that I call uh, rules of engagement. These rules of engagement are those things that have been agreed to before the heavenly court or the heavenly council that limit uh, the activity of the devil and his cohorts, but also correspondingly morally limit God. Because if God always keeps his promises, which I believe that he does, then insofar as God commits himself to some rules of engagement, God morally cannot contravene those commitments that he has made. So in a real sense, I believe there are many evils in the world that God morally cannot prevent. Although he has the sheer power to prevent them, mm. he morally cannot, given his commitments to free will in general, but also more specifically to the rules of engagement that are in place in this cosmic conflict. Eventually, the cosmic conflict is resolved by the suffering God of the cross. Uh, if we look to the God who voluntarily lowers himself, dies on the cross in Christ, we see that this God can be trusted, and it's through what God does that God defeats the allegations and provides the ultimate demonstration of his righteousness and his love that finally defeats the enemy's allegations and allows God to win the cosmic conflict and usher in uh, an eternity of bliss and harmony. It, I mean, obviously, th this goes well beyond some of the typical sort of more philosophical, if you like, um, ways in which people meet the question of God and evil. And we'll probably talk about some of those as we go along with with Thomas as well. But I mean, the, the, the thing that I can immediately hear the average skeptical atheist listener of this show saying is, well, great, you've, you've got a kind of an explanation for this. But to me, it just sounds like a fairy tale. It just sounds like some very extravagant backstory to this, the Christian story, um, which basically gets you off the hook, maybe in some way. Um, and, and I don't know, how do you respond to that? Because because at the end of the day, it, it's one thing to kind of give a fairly kind of logical philosophical defense like Alvin Planting as free will defense. And it's another thing then to go into the realm of the angels and demons and some kind of cosmic drama that's been going on since the beginning of eternity or whatever. Uh, wh what would you say to the the skeptic who says, well, yeah, sounds sounds like a an interesting story, but but, you know, not one that I have to believe in. Yeah, it, it's a fair question and understandable from somebody who would come from an atheist or agnostic background. I think that it's at first uh, important to clarify that this is not just some just so story. I think that uh, a story of the cosmic conflict is just embedded in the story of the gospel. Mm -hmm. You cannot read very far in the book of Matthew without encountering this kind of demonic conflict that Christ is involved in throughout his ministry. It's all over the Bible elsewhere, and even a part of what scripture emphasizes Christ came to do, to destroy the power of the devil, to destroy the works of the devil, etc. So when it comes to somebody uh, who may not already uh, agree uh, that this kind of story is true, I would say, first of all, that the way Plantinga puts it, plausibility is in the ear of the hearer. So what one considers to be plausible is going to depend a great deal on one's background beliefs. If one believes that there is a God, uh, particularly the God of the Bible or the God of Christianity, whose son is Jesus Christ, believes that the gospel narratives really happened, which I believe that they did, uh, 
uh, then there's going to be a cosmic conflict motif or framework that comes along with that. And given a belief in a supernatural God, belief in Jesus and the gospel story, I think it is indeed very plausible from a Christian perspective that there is such a cosmic conflict operating in the world. So I would just ask uh, that the atheist or agnostic would allow me, if they're asking me to make a defense with regard to the problem of evil, that I would be allowed to use the, the core beliefs of the framework that I come from, the Christian framework, and this cosmic conflict yeah. narrative is just embedded in the Christian story. I want to pick, obviously, explore it more as we go forward in the conversation soon, um, because I think we'll want to hear how that relates to the kinds of evils that we've been talking about, you know, disasters, earthquakes, um, uh, illness and disease and so on. Um, but the other perspective we've got on today's show, it's two Christian perspectives, but a very different Christian perspective in many ways uh, from Thomas J. Ord, um, who, as I said, is the author of God Can't, How to Believe in God and Love After Tragedy, Abuse and Other Evils, which very much... Um, picks up on his theology of the uncontrolling love of God. Thomas, welcome along to the show. Yeah, it's great to be here with you. It's great to have you on. Um, t tell us a little bit then about w what took you into sort of investigating these issues. Um, uh, presumably, you also maybe had a different way of approaching the problem of evil and suffering uh, earlier on in your life, and, and then you came to a quite unique and different way of understanding this later on, didn't you? Yeah, I think John and I share a lot in common in terms of our background. Uh, I was raised in a Christian home. I became one of those fanatical folks who uh, would go door to door witnessing for Jesus, trying to get people to become Christians. But then when I got into college, I began to look more deeply into the big questions that I had been uh, urging other people to look deeply into and encountered some folks from atheistic, agnostic or other religious perspectives and they were really smart <laughs> and uh, they kind of pulled the rug out from under the reasons I had for thinking it, there was a God and so uh, I remember coming to pick up my fiance who's now my wife and her getting into the car and me looking at her and saying I just can't believe in God anymore um, I was an atheist or an agnostic for a while and the problem of evil was one of uh, many uh, particular issues that brought me to that place. I eventually came to think that it was more plausible than not that there was a God. And there was two major issues that brought me to that place. One was this deep intuition that I ought to be a loving person, that other people ought to be loving, and that I needed some kind of ground or framework or uh, something that most people in the Christian tradition have called God to justify why I had these deep intuitions. And the second one is that I really felt like there had to be meaning in life, or at least I wanted there to be <laughs> meaning in life. Um, and I couldn't make sense of the possibility for ultimate meaning if there wasn't some kind of ground of meaning as well. Again, what many people call God. And so uh, that kind of brought me back to the place where I began to believe it was more plausible than not that there was a God. I wasn't certain there's a God. In fact, I'm still not certain there is. But uh, I began then to build from that kind of basis. And that eventually led me to the position that we're talking about today, a position that says that God loves everyone and everything, but God simply can't control anyone or anything. And the reason God can't do this is that God's nature is the self-giving and others empowering love. And because God's nature is love, and this love is this kind of uh, gift, God simply can't control not only free will creatures, but any creature or enti any entity in all of reality, because God loves every creature and every entity in all of reality. So funnily enough, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I actually had um, Mark Karras on my show two years ago. And he, oh, he, he yeah. wrote um, a book very much inspired by your own work called Divine Echoes, Reconciling Prayer with the Uncontrolling Love of God, and debating in that case petitionary prayer with um, Steve Jeffries, who holds a, a Calvinist position. Um, now, that's not the position that, that John holds, I don't think. But um, nonetheless, it was interesting to hear him laying out the 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 exactly what you've said there this idea that god it does not have this coercive kind of form of of engaging with humans um and 
and and it kind of led to that natural question well how does god get things done then in a sense what what are the means by which god is able to influence or bring his purposes and plans together in some way what i mean i'm taking it you're probably somewhere on you know to give you a label if you don't mind me doing so thomas uh, in the in the open theist kind of category of of theologian that that you don't believe god knows what the future may hold but yet do you still have a kind of view that that in some way god's purposes can still be done even with every creature having absolute freedom in 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 the universe yeah i'm an open relational theologian i think god is active everywhere at all times at every level of complexity and reality from complex creatures like humans to quarks so god is always active but in every instance in every case god is never the sole actor God never single-handedly determines any events. God is always calling, wooing, commanding, you know, use all kinds of language from the Christian or other theistic traditions for that matter, so long as that language doesn't give the impression that God is the only one to bring about some kind of an event. So this God uh, is active everywhere and invites, calls, commands. Um, perhaps an illustration that might help. Mm. Um, when I decided to ask my girlfriend to marry me, I made a decision. I acted. <laughs> I took her to dinner. I pulled out the ring. I acted and said, will you marry me? Now, the result of my actions, the consequences, what I really wanted to see happen was for her to say yes and for us to get married. But because I love her and because I'm not a coercive person, um, I had to wait for her response she did respond yes and so we got married so i got what i wanted she could have responded no however and we not got married and then i would have my my desires would have been thwarted i believe in a god whose desires are uh, sometimes thwarted because this god simply cannot single-handedly bring about events in the world that god wants because god's love is inherently uh, uncoercive or persuasive now, obviously, that this is a somewhat controversial position to take uh, in many people's eyes, because it does raise that question. Well, well, a does it comport with what the Bible says? Will be one question that's that's raised. But also, um, well, the question I asked originally really is: there any um, way of being sure that God will ultimately triumph um, if if it is as open as you say it is? You know, it doesn't sound like actually uh, if God is completely hands off in that way that necessarily things will end up going in the direction God wants ultimately. Yeah, let me, uh, I see two items there that I want to try to address quickly. One is the biblical one. I think the vast majority of scripture points to a God who works in tandem, not single-handedly uh, bringing events about. So in other words, whenever there are stories or mentions of God acting, there's always some kinds of other creaturely actors also mentioned. In fact, I don't, I'll make a stronger claim. I know of no biblical passage that explicitly says God alone brought about some uh, result. There are some that only mention God acting, but none explicitly say there were no creaturely factors or actors involved. I think the vast majority of people, including many biblical scholars, have come to the uh, Bible with a particular view of God in mind that's actually not explicitly mentioned in the text. In terms of the uh, can God win at the end, the eschat eschatology uh, view, I have a view that I call the relentless love eschatology, which says that God is always loving and never coercing in this life and the next. I do believe in an afterlife. And God never forces anyone into heaven or hell or anything like that. And because God simply can't control others, there's no guarantee that God will eventually win. Now, God never gives up, and I think God continues going on and on and on. I have the genuine hope that God finally um, is victorious because all creation cooperates. But I don't have the kind of guarantee that can only come from a God who decides to control, decides to uh, coerce, and make sure some people, either everybody goes to heaven or some people go to hell and others to go to heaven or God annihilates some or whatever eschatology you like. Um, I don't have that kind of a God. 
Very interesting. Um, we, we're almost, uh, you know, uh, just with your introductions, guys, um, uh, nearing the end of our first part. But but I will get a, a, a quick sort of um, idea of, of how you respond, John, to Thomas's very different way, I suppose, in some ways. There, I mean, having said that, there are some similarities, I think, between your yeah. positions, John. John. So do you want to spell out what you think maybe you where you think there are the similarities, but where you think the major differences are between the different ways you approach this? Yeah, there are similarities. We both believe that God is loving, that God uh, respects creaturely freedom. God respects uh, what Tom calls the law, the regularities of nature, what some would call laws of nature, uh, things like that. I do believe that God is loving, that God does not coerce in any way that is unloving. However, I do worry that Tom's account uh, resolves the problem of evil at the cost of denying uh, uh God's omnipotence, or at least God's omnipotence as traditionally understood, that God does not have the power to prevent evil. And one of the issues with that is the eschatological issue, the, the problem of, of how you can ensure that God wins. And as Tom just said, he, he doesn't have any guarantee that in the end, uh, everything it does uh, come back to an eternal bliss of, of love. And I think it may resolve the philosophical problem, but I'm not sure it's very much help with regard to the actual defeating of real evil in the world, which is more important than just the philosophical problem. I'm also concerned about whether it can account uh, for the kinds of miracles that God is portrayed as working in the Bible, not just whether God can work miracles at all. I know Tom has an account of how God can work miracles. But if it is the case that God uh, worked the miracles in the Bible, particularly some of the, the miracles Jesus works, like calming storms, uh, feeding the hungry, multiplying food, uh, healing all kinds of sicknesses and illnesses, even resurrecting the dead. If Jesus can do those kinds of things, if he really did those kinds of things, the Gospels say that he did, then those kinds of miracles cannot be intrinsically unloving or intrinsically coercive in a way that is unloving. So if those kinds of miracles are not intrinsically unloving, and that means it would seem that God could work in those same kinds of ways in the world today, uh, because it seems that those things are not unloving if God actually did them in the past. So I'm not sure how Tom accounts for why God doesn't do similar kinds of things in the world today. On my account, the reason why God uh, often doesn't do similar things is because of those rules of engagement that I believe God has morally committed himself to that limits God from doing a lot of uh, things that he would like to do. So many evils in the world God would want to prevent, he prefers to prevent, but doing so would either compromise the kind of free will God has committed to granting for the sake of love, or it would go against the rules of engagement, or it would actually lead to more evil or less flourishing of love in a way we don't fully understand. So I do worry about uh, Tom's account, uh, Tom's account's ability to deal with those kinds of miracles. Uh, I worry about uh, the definition of what counts as coercion. Why would it be unloving uh, for God to act uh, so that someone is pushed out of the way of a car that's oncoming or act to destroy cancer cells? I, I don't understand why that would be unloving. Uh, yeah, more than just that. Yeah, uh, just, uh, well, that'll think. give us plenty to go on. Um, but as I say, um, we're we're already fast approaching the end of our, our first section here, so um, we'll we'll give uh, Thomas some time to respond in the next section. What I will say, though, just to, as we draw draw to an end of this first part, is I'm I'm hearing from both of you though that neither of you take the Calvinist view. Let's say that God <laughs> is responsible for all of the stuff going on good and bad basically it's all been predetermined in a sense by god for his greater glory but actually you're both saying no there's there's an element of freedom that god has given in your case john it's um there's an element of freedom that it is both in the human realm and in this sort of cosmic angelic demonic realm um and and we have to take that into account when we see some of the bad things going on around us uh thomas's view is actually the freedom is kind of absolute almost in 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 that sense that god um, simply does not even have the power to, in his lovingness, um, coerce in any way any free creature to do something or, or to, 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 to meddle in that way. So um, uh, be fascinated to open this up a little bit more in the next section of today's program. Uh, doing a deep theological dive today on two approaches to solving the problem of God and evil. My guests are John Peckham and Thomas J. Ord. You're listening to Unbelievable. What I want to invite Roger to comment on is why couldn't the mental realm include an infinite consciousness? It's too much like us. <laughs> <laughs>
it's it's too <laughs> much like, like putting it like <laughs> yes, like the Greek views of the gods in some sense. They were like too much like but us. They were finite. <laughs> and contingent. Here we're talking about a metaphysically necessary source. I admire this noble aspiration to find the highest possible ideal. It's almost as if you're proposing a new religion to meet this new challenge. It's not a new religion. Yes. What it is is something that sits in the same place. Mm. It addresses some of the same needs, but it is not founded on the same principle. If the New Testament says that Jesus did X, Y, and Z, did he do it or not? I don't think it's a story that's made by committee. Am I going to have a later literary genius who comes up with a great story like this? Or am I going to say, no, Jesus is the genius, and somehow that story has basically been preserved? Welcome back to today's edition of the program, looking at uh, an important and age-old question. If God is all-powerful and entirely good and loving, why is there so much evil in the world? Now, many people have proffered theodicies of one sort or another to uh, solve this problem. Um, John Peckham's book, uh, which is called Theodicy of Love, Cosmic Conflict and the Problem of Evil, suggests that God's love is at the centre of a cosmic drama involving Satan, the angelic realm, the demonic, demonic realm that provides uh, significant insights into why certain aspects of evil um, come into play in the world. Thomas J. Ord takes quite a different view. Um, his view, the uncontrolling love of God, makes the case that God actually has no control of the physical world, um, and that is because of the character of God, um, the non-coercive love he has in relation to creation. Um, and so there's a couple of things in a way to respond to there, uh, Thomas, on, on the back of what John had to say. There's both his criticisms of your particular way of looking at this, but also any criticisms you may have of his uh, divine cosmic drama kind of view of, of why there is natural evil and such in the world. So, um, yeah, do you want to first of all maybe give your reaction to, to, to John's overall case in The Odyssey of Love? Yeah, I, thanks. Uh, there's lots and lots of things I'd like to say. Let me start by saying John and, and I do share several things in common related to God's love. But I think the, the biggest glaring difference is this omnipotence thing. So let me uh, just briefly say some of my reservations about John uh, talking about the God he describes as omnipotent. And then I'll respond to some of his uh, recent comments uh, related to miracles and those kinds of things. I don't really think John's God is omnipotent. I think he wants to retain that word, but when you start fleshing it out, the word kind of dissolves in its meaning. Right up front in the book, he says what most theologians say by saying, you know, this God can't do what is illog uh, illogical or logically impossible. Mm -hmm. But then he also tacks on in the book that this God can't go against God's own nature that this God uh, makes uh, these rules of engagement that this God can't uh, overcome, that this God makes certain kind of promises that God uh, won't uh, break. Um, imagine, Justin, if you said to me, um, Tom, I've got this amazing squirrel in my backyard who's omnipotent. And I said, you got to be kidding me, a squirrel that's omnipotent? You said, yep, this, this squirrel can do anything. And I said, well, can this uh, squirrel make a round circle? And you said, no, 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 no. I mean, that's, that's not logically possible. I said, uh, can this squirrel make one plus one equal 284? You said, no, 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 come on. That's, that's not logical either. So I said, you know, I need a ride to the airport tomorrow. Can this squirrel drive me to the airport? And you said, come on, it's not in the nature of a squirrel to drive a car. And I said, uh, well, what about my taxes? I need someone to do my taxes this year. Can this squirrel do my taxes? And you say, come on, it's not in the nature of a squirrel to do taxes. The squirrel can't do that. So I said, okay, well, let's make this easier. I've got 50 walnuts. I want your squirrel to put these 50 walnuts in various places around my house. And you said, well, I've got some bad news for you, Tom. Um, my squirrel has promised not to put other people's walnuts various places around the yard. 
And I said, well, why? What's going on there? Well, there's this bad squirrel down the block and they've got this conflict going on. So these rules of engagement are there. And this, my squirrel can't do that because that would, would go against the promise he made to this other bad squirrel. I said, well, okay, I've got one walnut. Could this squirrel take this one walnut and put it somewhere in the backyard? He said, well, you know, turns out this squirrel made a promise that he's not going to take your walnut because you wouldn't learn what needs to happen in terms of hiding walnuts. You have to make some progress in terms of uh, what it means to find good hiding places. Besides, it would upset the order of all the other squirrels and how this whole thing works. Now, John's got obviously, I'm, I'm not saying John's got is a squirrel. What I'm saying here is that if you continue to press me and say this squirrel is omnipotent and had all of these caveats, all of these qualifications, at the end of the day, that word omnipotent really doesn't mean a whole lot. This God really can't do all kinds of things. And I think this is not just a conceptual philosophical battle over words. This really gets to the heart where a lot of people live. I get letters almost weekly from people who read my God Can't book, and they're so relieved to believe there's a God of love who couldn't have stopped the bad things that happened to them. They've been told they, there's this omnipotent God who can do practically anything. Um, but then if you start looking at what this God can actually do in John's particular view, it's really whittled down to not very much. There's lots of things this God can't do. So I would prefer for John and actually lots of other theologians, John's not the only one here. It's just that John adds on some more things that others don't. I would prefer them to drop this word omnipotence, come up with some other thing. I mean, no word's perfect. You got to define your words, et cetera. And again, I'm not saying John's God is exactly the same as a squirrel. <laughs> John's God is, mm. you know, knows the future and is omnipresent. But this word omnipotent, I think, loses all of its power in all the ways Okay. Uh, because of all the things that John and and, and in a sense they're closer to your position than they might admit um, in in doing exactly so. um, yeah so and I will let John respond to that in a, in a short moment's time I mean one let's just at least bring one of the issues that John brought against your position which is well what do you do with your non coercive non interventionist God if you like um, when you do look at the case for you know miracles in the Bible I mean you know, Christianity is founded on a miracle a resurrection of Jesus Christ it looks a lot like God intervened in a pretty dramatic way, at least then yeah. uh, in, in history. So does that count against the idea of this God who is very hands off um, uh, in terms of, of any specific actions in uh, uh, that, that might contravene any human freedom? Yeah, my God is hands on, not hands off. And I don't think there's a single Bible or a single um, a story or miracle in the Bible that contradicts the view of God I've presented. And I also think God is in the business of doing miracles today. The big issue, though, is this. Do these miracles occur because God single-handedly brought them about, or do they occur because there's some kind of cooperation by creaturely factors, uh, organs, cells, etc.? Or is there some kind of conditions of creation that are conducive to these miracles happening. In other words, I don't think that, uh, you know, corks have free will, but I do think that there are certain conditions that God respects to use the language John likes to use here, such that uh, sometimes miracles can occur because the conditions of creation are appropriate. So I do have a miracle working God. It's just that none of the miracles that God does are God single-handedly bringing them about. And I think there's no biblical passage to say that that happens. And I don't think there's any examples today of miracles in which God okay. alone did them. Let, let me toss it back to you now, John. Um, maybe start with uh, Thomas's objection that your God isn't actually very omnipotent once you add all the qualifying factors there. Uh, and he used the, uh, well, I don't know what you thought of his squirrel example, but is, is, <laughs> is it a divine version of the squirrel in the backyard? No, no, I don't think I don't think so at all. <laughs> um, I think I think Tom's comments uh, obviously bring to mind that there are a lot of misunderstandings of what omnipotence is. If one thinks that omnipotence means God can do just anything, then of course you would have a problem. 
But the traditional understanding of God's omnipotence uh, uh, recognizes that God, even God can't do two contradictory things. So God can't bring about two logically contradictory possibilities. He can't give creatures free will that he does not determine and then determine that they freely do what he wants them to do. Uh, and also, just to say God acts consistent with his own nature, uh, that is not analogous to, to Tom Squirrel in example, because part of God's nature uh, is to, to be all-powerful, that he can do all things, uh, he is all-powerful. Now, I, I, Tom, I think, suggests that the God on my account, uh, there's a lot of things that he cannot do. Uh, but the main difference here is that it's not that God cannot do these things in principle, or that he intrinsically cannot do them. It's that he cannot do any things that fall temporarily within the jurisdiction of the enemy within this cosmic conflict. So these are temporary restrictions. That's one major difference. So in the end, God can and will exercise his power to defeat evil. Once all of the allegations have been resolved, once every mind in the universe recognizes that God is entirely good and loving. So these are temporary restrictions and they are dynamic. So faith makes a difference. Prayer makes a difference. The way Jesus talks about the demon the disciples couldn't cast out in Mark 9, he says this kind can only come out by prayer. So there are many things God can do, and I believe that God did in the Bible work many kinds of very robust miracles. My theodicy of love, as I lay out in the book, I don't have time to lay it out here, but my theodicy of love has a very robust account of God's providence. God is working miracles. He is acting in a very strong way to relieve sicknesses and maladies and all kinds of things. But when he doesn't, in the many cases he doesn't, I don't think it's because he doesn't want to. I think it's because there are other moral impediments that are temporarily restraining him from doing and, so. And, and that would include the, the sort of activity of the, 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 the realm of evil and um, the, the, those spiritual powers of darkness and so on. So, so give me an example of, I mean, it's very hard. Sometimes this is, feels a little bit abstract um, and strange. But for instance, you know, when someone contracts cancer, and as far as we can see, there's no particular... Uh, human reason why they would have done that do would you say no that's not certainly that's not god desiring that person to contract cancer but uh and uh it's but at the same time it's not just the random events of what happens in a free universe um that there is in fact a dark spiritual side to illness and disease and and that somehow god has not been able to override those factors do you want to sort of sketch out what that could in principle look like yeah so i certainly agree that god does not desire those kinds of illnesses uh, and diseases and sicknesses uh, but when it comes to natural evils or evils in nature um i don't think that there are any evils that are purely natural in the sense that i agree with planning and others that evil came into the universe by the rebellious decisions of creatures uh, beginning with those decisions uh, of Satan and his angels to fall and rebel against God. Now, when it comes to evils in the world today, I think there are at least uh, two elements that are very important. So I don't make the claim that when there is a natural evil in the world today, it is necessarily the direct result of some kind of demonic activity. There are instances in the Bible where sicknesses and illnesses are attributed uh, to demonic agency that Jesus casts out. So I don't rule that out either. Uh, but I wouldn't claim that uh, each evil is caused in a directly proximate way by the free decisions of creatures. What I mean to say is that free will introduced, uh, the misuse of free will introduced evil into the world that affected the way the world is. Uh, the world involves all kinds of evils and sicknesses and diseases that I do not think would be there if the world had remained as God wanted it to be, if every creature had never rebelled against God. I do think that there are some laws and forces of nature operating that God primordially set up for the best good of all creatures. And I think it's also quite possible that the cosmic conflict caused some of those forces and laws to go out of equilibrium and that there are other kinds of things introduced that weren't there originally that are now part of the rules of engagement that God uh, normally is not going to contravene for a host of reasons. And there also might be a uh, special supernatural activity, but I wouldn't try to say a particular illness or a particular tragedy is directly caused by demon demonic activity. Uh, sometimes it is those uh, effects of the order of nature, what some call gnomic regularity, which itself appears to be necessary for a kind of consequential freedom so that creatures can make 
uh, decisions and reasonably be able to predict uh, the moral consequences of those decisions. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, still plenty there for Thomas. To, there's so many different directions we could take a lot of these issues mm-hmm. and time time, time uh, won't allow us to, to pick up on everything. But um, maybe coming back to you then, Thomas. So, uh, I mean, what do you what do you make of this sort of... Um, the, the way that, that these other characters play into this. I mean, do you have any space in your own theology, Thomas, for um, the role of uh, Satan, the powers of evil, and those sorts of things that obviously are critical to John's way of seeing how how everything is playing out um, and the way in which God is constrained at some level to to the different aspects of the creation and uh, and what's going on? Yeah, my my theology is neutral on whether or not there are demons and and a devil who exerts influence in the world. My theodicy can work if there is, and it can work if there isn't. So I don't need to take a stance on it, because the ultimate question is not that. The ultimate question is what kind of power does God have? John wants to say that in principle God can do anything. You know, that's not logically impossible. And John wants to say at the end God's going to you know, make everything right. And God has that kind of omnipotence. This brings up all kinds of problems with what God's, why doesn't God use this power in the meantime? Uh, Why doesn't God step in to prevent the cancer that you mentioned or stop some rape? Well, John's got an account in which he says, God, uh, from the beginning, at least in these kinds of issues, uh, decided to make a covenant with uh, the evil one. God does de- deals with the devil, we might say. And God makes this promise based on this heavenly counsel and in relation to these demonic forces. And this promise involves God not, quote, intervening in all of these kinds of instances, even though God in principle could, but God made a promise at the beginning not to. I think this is a God who makes lousy promises. (laughs) Um, I think this God ought to break these promises in the name of love to prevent horrific evils in the world. Suppose uh, my teenage daughter decides that she wants to spend, uh, you know, lots of time on the phone, like a lot of teenagers do, at least they used to before texting took over. But let's say she's a, you know, talks on the phone a lot. And she says, I really need my privacy, dad. So when the door is shut, don't interrupt me. I'm talking on the fo- phone if the door is shut, and it's just part of the process of being a teenager. I need my privacy sometimes. And I say, okay, I promise. I won't come in or even knock on the door if I see it shut because I'll assume you're talking on the phone. Now, suppose uh, a fire breaks out in my house, and I get everybody out, and I look out, and there my teenage daughter is not outside. So I run back in the house, go through the flames, up the stairs. I go to her door, and it turns out the door is shut. And I think to myself, oh, I made a promise not to go in if that door is shut. Now, do you think I'm going to break that promise in that moment to try to rescue my daughter? You bet I am, because I think love demands that I make a bad promise. I think the kind of promises that John lays out here that God somehow allegedly made at the beginning are ones that come in conflict with God's love. And God ought to break those promises if, in fact, God made them, which I don't think God did. I mean, that's where I think. Yeah, go ahead, John. Go ahead. I I think that that kind of perspective actually would bring you into conflict with your own position. So it sounds to me like you're saying God can't prevent the evils in the world because uh, for God to prevent those kinds of evils, God would have to do something unloving. But you also say in your book that uh, a a loving God should prevent evil when he can. So on one hand, uh, you say it would be unloving to prevent those those kinds of evils, but God should actually use his power to prevent those kind of evils if he could. So my question is, which is it? Is it loving or unloving? Uh, When it comes to to my account, I don't think that God is making bad promises, and I think it's, it's it's interesting that you would say God should break his promises because that would itself be to do something unloving. And if the cosmic conflict is itself a conflict over character, uh, you can imagine a different kind of story. So you imagine a mayor who's accused of corruption and this mayor that's accused of corruption has all the power in the world to just, to just completely squash any kind of claims against his government. If he uh, exercises his power to do that or doesn't allow uh, the other agent to actually make their case against him, That's only going to exacerbate the problem. And so I think God in his infinite wisdom and his infinite love 
he knows because he's taking into account other minds. It's not, it's not a matter of something that he is just agreeing to with the devil per se. This is taking place before a heavenly council, a heavenly court, which is very robustly represented throughout scripture. And so therefore the rules of engagement are far from ideal. But to the question as to why a loving God would agree to those rules, it's because there may not be any other way for God to once and for all settle this conflict in a way that will not undermine love relationship, will not make other creatures wonder if God is a tyrant and end up serving God out of fear. But what I don't understand is, is on Tom's account, why God can't do the kinds of things that he does in scripture. Why would it be unloving to destroy cancer cells? Why would it be unloving to heal sicknesses like Jesus heals? I don't think that his account can actually satisfactorily address the kinds of evils that God deals with in the Bible. And it, I think my account has all the salient advantages because I think there is a real sense in which there are things that God morally cannot do temporarily. And yet God can do all those kinds of miracles in particular circumstances. Uh, it's just that we don't know which circumstances those are. And in the end, more importantly, God has the power to actually ensure that evil is finally defeated and will never rise again. So, so the, the, and I had a very similar question for you, Thomas, which is, given your criticism of uh, the God who refuses to break his promises uh, in John's case, isn't your God equally potentially um, on the hook for the fact that uh, he, he has chosen simply never to intervene? Um, or is that somehow intrinsic to the way you regard God, that that, that God cannot yes, intervene yeah. in that way? That's right. I don't have a God who promises not to intervene. I've got a God whose very nature is love that never intervenes. So it's not a, a choice on God's part. It's just who God is. It's God's nature. I like to sometimes contrast my views with one I think that's similar to John's and one on the other side of me. The one that's similar to John's, I call the divine uh, voluntary self-limitation. God, either because of some counsels or rules of engagement or some promise, God has voluntarily decided not to intervene and stop evils, even though in principle God could. That's not my view. It's something close to John's. On the other side of me is the idea that God is constrained by some sort of external forces, be they demons and principalities or laws of nature or metaphysical laws, all kinds of things. But God is like, Ugh, I'd like to do something here, but God is God saying, I can't because these things outside of me are preventing me. My view says God's constraints come from God's own nature, not something external from God. But God doesn't choose God's own nature. That's just who God is from all eternity. And what's important here for your question is this nature is self-giving, others empowering, and therefore uncontrolling love. And so God doesn't simply choose not to control. It's just the way God acts because that's God's nature. But, but you do believe, um, I think this is part of John's question to you, that God has yeah. acted through human means in, in kind of collaboration, as it were, with human freedom. Definitely, yeah. Um, and and in, in as much as that happens, um, it, what, is it not unloving to, to if, if God can do that somehow, for, the, for that not to happen sometimes in cases where you know well why why do i suppose the question is why doesn't you know god act when the person prays for that person to be healed of cancer what it, it does is it that sometimes the cooperation does happen and sometimes it doesn't what's the kind of variable uh, yes that's there kind you go. of yeah where i'm confused that's here. where it's going yeah so god is always acting and wants to heal all kinds of cancerous cells stop rapes war etc but God can't do it single-handedly. So God has to call to free creatures, other entities to cooperate in some kind of way. So it's not the case that God did it one place single-handedly, and then you ask, well, why doesn't God do it other cases? God always acts, and there's always some kind of cooperation or not. And so when miracles don't happen, we don't blame God for not stepping in and single-handedly doing it. We say either the conditions of creation were not conducive or there wasn't kind of the kind of cooperation necessary for those miracles. There's nothing in the Bible that opposes that view. John. So I don't, I don't see how it would be unloving or go against creaturely cooperation, cooperation to destroy cancer cells, for instance, or to say um, work the kinds of miracles that we see in scripture. So you have God preserving 
uh, three Hebrews and Daniel three from burning in a fire. You have uh, an angel shutting the mouth of lions. And here, uh, again, I think uh, a voluntary free will defense uh, has all the advantages of Ord's account without the, the negatives of not allowing God to be omnipotent and not having a, an actual guarantee that uh, it will be okay in the end, that evil is actually going to be dealt with. When it comes to those examples, um, why can't God uh, push somebody out of the way of a vehicle? Uh, why can't God, even if you put aside what God is directly doing, there's a lot of kinds of evils in the world that God could prevent simply by a revelation, an advance warning. And you can't say that for God to do that would be intrinsically unloving because God does those kinds of things in the Bible. He warns Pharaoh of the famine, for instance. So if you imagine, say, a, a tragic plane crash, uh, in, if the plane crash is caused by a mechanical difficulty, for God to prevent that without undermining any freedom, without going against any creature cooperation, all he would have to do would be to actually reveal to someone in a position to fix that plane before the crash that there's going to be such a crash. And God could know that even if on your, I believe God knows the future, but even if he doesn't know the future, he would have enough present knowledge to be able to actually uh, prevent those kinds of evils without coercing or, or forcing anyone. On my account, the reason why God doesn't do that is because, again, there are rules and parameters where God can reveal himself, especially in some specific cases, especially in covenant revelation. But in other cases, it would be against the rules. It would be unfair. The enemy wouldn't be allowed to make his case fully. But in your account, I don't see why God couldn't just alert someone in advance. And that alone would actually resolve a great many of the kinds of evils that we see in the world today. Uh, and all the kinds of miracles Jesus worked, putting aside the claim that they're not done unilaterally, if Jesus could do them then, it would seem that he could do them now. Um, yeah. yeah, I believe well, in miracles now. So, yeah. Well, well, think... well let, let, <laughs> let, let me, I'll let you come back to that in a moment's time. We're, okay, we're already at sure. the end of our second part and we'll, we'll have another 10 or 15 minutes to, to continue the conversation shortly. Um, but it's uh, Thomas J. Ord who's going to respond in a moment to John Peckham on today's show. Two different perspectives, two different theodicies, you could say, on uh, the problem of God and evil. Uh, that's what we're debating today on Unbelievable with me, Justin Briley. And we'll be back with the final part very soon. If you listen to Unbelievable with Justin Briley on Premier Christian Radio and enjoy the conversations between Christians and skeptics, then this is the perfect app for you. For the latest updates, podcasts, videos, articles, bonus content and much more, download the Premier Unbelievable app today. Welcome back to the final part of today's show. And it's it's been a really interesting discussion between John Peckham and Thomas J. Ord with their different perspectives, both theologians and philosophers on the problem of suffering and evil and how to reconcile that with a God who is good and loving. Um, so, uh, Thomas, John's view is, is this divine counsel, cosmic drama kind of view in which, to some extent, God has chosen, as he says, voluntarily to submit to certain rules of engagement, if you like. And where we do see, you know, miracles and good things happening and, and answers to prayer, it's it's where, as, as it were, the battle has been won. And in places where we don't, it's where the, the powers of evil are currently winning. Ultimately, God will win and all things will be put right. Um, and I can see the attraction of that view because it suggests that God isn't um, as it were, the, the, your view is very different because it, it, it suggests a God who, who never intervenes unilaterally in any kind of case. Uh, it's always, as you say, in I, I'm guessing sort of in collaboration, in cooperation, as you say, with huma, humans. Now, John can't see how that wouldn't still give God license to simply act in cases like he mentioned where he could perhaps reveal to someone in a miraculous way. Uh, that some event is going to happen uh, that wouldn't override their freedom. It uh, doesn't. It, he can't see any way in which that would be coercive. Um, so, what's what's your point? What? And I'd just be interested in how you respond to some of those biblical examples he brought about, you know, warning Pharaoh of the famine or, or other things. Firstly, whether you how much store you put in biblical miracles anyway, but um, but how you respond to the way that they're portrayed in scripture, which do seem to have God acting to some extent unilaterally, regardless of people's cooperation. Well, I think a lot of people have assumed God is acting unilaterally in those instances, but I don't think we have to, and I don't think the scriptures require us to do so. I think maybe there's so many things I want to say in response to John's good questions. I think I'm going to really quickly go over three examples he gives and respond to them on how my view accounts for them. 
first of all, he wants to talk about God destroying cancer cells. I said at the start that God loves everyone and everything. And that means God can't control anyone or anything. I think God loves cells. And when those cells become cancerous, God doesn't utterly destroy them. Just like God doesn't utterly destroy people when they become sinful. So God's love extends even to the cellular level in terms of not destroying others. God works to heal those cells, but that's different than destroying them. John also uh, talks about, um, uh, I can't read my own notes here. Well, well, the, another, the one oh, I'd be interested in is, is this idea of giving a, a revelation to someone. That wouldn't be yes. coercive okay, or act against their freedom. Yeah. It, yeah. So what's... So hmm. in my view, God does act to reveal, but God never acts unilaterally to reveal. In other words, revelation always in, involves some kind of cooperation or lack thereof in the world. This not only accounts for why sometimes we do seem to have better and clearer understandings of what God is up to, but also for why we never can know with absolute certainty what God is up to. And it also helps to account for the problems we find in Scripture in which there are errors or contradictory accounts it accounts for why today people have different views of what God wants done in the world. If God has the kind of ability to give a crystal clear, unambiguous revelation to anyone at any time, God's doing a really poor job of that. And God has been doing a poor job since the beginning of time. If, however, God is always working to reveal, but there are obstacles real obstacles for us to getting that clear, crystal clear message. And we have to actually cooperate, listen metaphorically to God. Then we have a way to overcome this problem of revelation while still affirming that revelation can occur. I mean, before John comes back on this, I, I mean, just just to, you know, take this uh, analogy further or, or the, the example, yeah. at least, that, we, that we've been looking at. So let's say, for I mean, do you believe it is possible in principle for someone uh, to receive a message from God, a revelation from God, a, a pilot, you know, decides, feels that God is telling them to check that pipe before they take off. And, hey, what do you know, if it taken off, that would have caused, you know, some terrible disaster and and that disaster is averted. It, and, and in cases where that revelation doesn't happen and tragedy ensues, is it because it is actually some factor of the human that they didn't pray, that they didn't give God the opportunity to, to, to give them the revelation. I'm just trying to understand what that yeah. would look like Great in, question. in practice. Yeah. yeah, when it doesn't happen, it could be a whole realm of possible factors. When it does happen, I don't think it ever happens because God implanted that information unilaterally. Either the person had some intuition, and of course, sometimes our intuitions are wrong. So that person wouldn't even know with absolute certainty that checking this particular thing is what needed to be happen and needed to happen. So, um, yes, these revelations can occur, but they're never God somehow doing it all alone. And when they don't occur, it's not because God isn't trying. It's because there's other factors or lack of cooperation. But can God give direct special revelation? There's many accounts in the Bible of God giving direct special revelation. Uh, you seem to, to want to uh, undermine that by saying if God can give direct special revelation, he ought to do it more often and make us understand him better. Uh, this is where I think, again, a, a cosmic conflict rules of engagement account helps because I think special revelation is limited by those rules of engagement. I think there are special privileges in the covenant lineage for God to make his case within these rules of engagement. But on your account, it seems you either have to deny that God can give those kinds of direct special revelations, visions and dreams, the kinds of things God does in the Bible, or uh, you don't have an explanation for why God doesn't do it to prevent the many kinds of evils that you say God can't prevent. Wouldn't it yeah. be more loving for God to do that? And why wouldn't God be able to do that? Yeah, so uh, it's interesting. Both John and I want to talk about real limitations on what God can do and what God can reveal. I say these limitations are inherent in God's loving nature. God simply can't control to make sure that these revelations are crystal clear. John wants to say that it has to do with God making a promise in these kind of rules of engagement. We're both talking about limitations. Uh, my God can't overcome these kind of limitations because it would go against God's very nature. John's God can overcome them if God decided to not do this particular uh, rules of engagement, this counsel. Or John seems to suggest that in the end, God will overcome these, these rules of engagement or at least these limitations. 
So it's strange that I'm the one being attacked for having a view that is, I think, consistent with God's very nature, whereas John has a view that God decides to take on these limitations when God didn't have to at the beginning, and from some mysterious way, God is going to overcome them at the end. So, so certainly I don't, I don't want to be attacking you in any way. Um, but I think, uh, for one thing, I don't see how it's any better to say God intrinsically is limited to granting freedom of the kind that's good for love and the, the regularities of nature that are good for love, and saying that God had the freedom to create a world voluntarily, didn't have to, and then freely gives that world the kind of freedom that is good for the flourishing of love. We both agree that freedom is good for the flourishing of love. I'm saying God does it voluntarily. You're saying it's involuntary. I don't see how involuntarily granting that is better. Uh, when it well, comes to God uh, do, doing these things, I also have ways in which God is essentially limited. Uh, and you, do, you, you mentioned this as well in your book, that God cannot break his promises, right? He cannot deny his own nature. Uh, this is actually taught uh, in 2 Timothy 2.13. He, he is without falsehood or cannot lie, depending on the translation in Titus 1.2. So if God makes promises, he's going to keep them. One can question whether God should have made those promises, but only God knows everything that needs to be known to make those kinds of decisions. And it's not that God can just unilaterally at any time do this or that. There are some things that even God can't do, not because he lacks power, but because to bring them about would be a contradiction. He can't make someone freely love him. He can't make someone freely believe that he is truly good and loving. Just like I can't make my wife, if I could control my wife's beliefs, this is why it's an epistemic conflict. If I could control my wife's beliefs, then I would, she wouldn't be free to love or not love me. So if God is operating in that kind of a scenario, there are things God can't do with regard to the allegations of the other minds. He can't actually make it unilaterally such that they freely come to recognize his love, not because he lacks power, but because to do that would be a contradiction. So I don't see how you can say that God should break his promises because that would go against the very loving nature that we both agree God has. No, uh, you might want to say he shouldn't make those promises in the first place, but if that was the only way in God's infinite wisdom for these allegations to be settled once and for all, if that was for the best good of the universe, then God may indeed have morally sufficient reasons for making those kinds of commitments. And I think we have good reason to trust that the God who voluntarily dies on the cross suffers when we suffer, uh, that he has done everything that he can for this world, that if there was a more preferable way, he would have chosen it. And we see even in the ministry of Christ, he seems to be limiting himself. There are some places where he could do not, not do miracles because of lack quick, of faith. Uh, some demons don't come out because of yeah. prayer. Uh, quick, quick. In the temptation narrative, there's all kinds of limits on Jesus' power, etc. Quick, quick response, Thomas. And then I'll, I'll, I'm going to ask a final question for you both that kind of hopefully brings this, the pastoral dimension of this a bit into play as well, because um, we've had a lot of obviously theological and important theological debate here but um but obviously this yeah. is ultimately a, a pastoral question for most people so yeah but quick quick response from you first thomas well i think the first uh, response john had was why is it intrinsically better for a god who can't by nature prevent evil versus the kind of scenario john wants to bring up and i think as i mentioned earlier one of the major reasons it's intrinsically better is because it says to victims of evil survivors that God just could not have stopped that from happening to them. In John's particular view, it sounds like, in fact, John says, God allows it, God permits it. And to those who suffer, that doesn't sound like very good news because it sounds to them like God could have stopped it unilaterally. Now, John's got some caveats for why you know that's not the case. But listen from a pastoral perspective, listen or try to put yourself in the place of a victim is it better to say god couldn't have stopped what happened to me or god chose not to or wouldn't um i think it's intrinsically more valuable to those who suffer to say that a loving god was there with you but couldn't have stopped it rather than saying god was there and allowed it but we both can say that at the moment of the actual suffering we both can say that god it would be unloving for god to stop it it's just we have different reasons for saying it's unloving. In my view, God morally cannot because of other commitments he's made. But once he's made those commitments, it is unloving to do I, that. I, and if those commitments themselves are the best for love, then then I think my, my view can say what yours says, but without the disadvantages of denying omnipotence and eschatological hope. Can, can I ask a final question for, for you both? Okay. And the example you, you mentioned earlier, um, uh, 
John, made me think of that that awful recent tragedy of Kobe Bryant and his daughter in that helicopter slammed into the side of a hill in L.A. Um, almost random. It's, it seems absolutely arbitrary almost, you know. Um, no one predicted that. We don't know what factors might have been at play in terms of human error or whatever it may have been. But but accepting that it's simply a tragic accident and, and many people struggling with that with you know with suddenly someone who was obviously such a live wire successful person sports personality suddenly wiped wiped off and family in pieces over that i mean what is at the end of the day and i'll start with you first john what's what would be your the thing you would do pastorally how does your theodicy affect the way you then speak to the family who are grieving that sudden catastrophic loss yeah Yeah. First, I want to be very clear, and I think Tom and I both agree on this, that any kind of theodicy that has to trivialize the real evils in the world or suggest they're not really that bad after all, it does more harm than help. And when people are really going through acute suffering, trying to deal with tragedy, often the last thing they need is to try to to, to hear a theological explanation of how that reconciles with God's goodness and love. I do think that before such tragedies or after such tragedies, when someone is willing to wrestle with maybe the cognitive dissonance they're experiencing about about God, I think understanding that God is love, uh, that there is more to the story going on, uh, many unseen factors that we cannot see, but God is doing the most loving thing in every single scenario. Uh, There are many things we do not understand, uh, similar uh, to the way when my son needed to have a blood draw when he was very young, he was less than two, he had to have his blood drawn to make sure Uh, that he uh, did not need a particular very uh, strong treatment. Uh, He was looking at me like when I was holding him down, the nurse said, you need to hold him down where he's getting the blood drawn. He's looking at me like, daddy, why are you letting letting this happen to me? And there's nothing that I could say at the moment that would explain to him why I was doing what I was doing. But what I was doing is what is best for him. And I would say, even if we don't understand God's reasons, even if we lack that information, uh, I think we can look to the suffering God of the cross that God voluntarily suffers for us in Christ. Not just at the cross, I think he suffers whenever we suffer. And that kind of God can be trusted. His promise is sure that the way Paul puts it in Romans 8, 18, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed. And that's not to trivialize these sufferings. It's to say that what God has in store is exponentially better. And if there was a preferable way for God to achieve that, he would have chosen it. It could have been achieved another way if creatures would have cooperated. But because of the way creatures have misused their free will necessary for love, because God is not going to undermine love, which would actually be worse for all creatures involved, he works this way in the most loving way at great cost to himself. So God is with us. He loves us more than we can imagine. He suffers with us. Uh, There are parameters that can make sense of why God might not intervene in situations. But in particular situations, we don't know exactly what God is doing or why he's not doing it. But We have reason to trust in the God who is revealed in Jesus Mm. Christ, the God of the cross. Thank you very much. Um, Thomas, what would your pastoral response be to the family of Kobe Bryant and in the wake of that tragic accident? Well, I'm with, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I'm with John in terms of the strategy of, you know, waiting until there's the appropriate time. <clears throat> excuse me, I got something stuck in my Sorry. throat. Um, I think, though, that when the time came, I would just be blunt and say, God, could not have stopped what happened. God could not have prevented that tragedy single-handedly. God was present. God was calling upon everyone to do the very best they could in that situation, including the helicopter pilot. <clears throat> but there were factors involved. Apparently, there was uh, um, uh, fog, etc., that made it the case that God couldn't single-handedly prevent the crash. Um, I wouldn't do what John hints at some in his response. I wouldn't claim mystery. I wouldn't say things like, well, God has certain kinds of reasons that we can't understand. Uh, that kind of response, I think, has led a lot of people to um, to situations in which theology just becomes a kind of a game we play in which we can't find answers, and then we play the mystery card. I also wouldn't uh, somehow say that this is a part of some future that God has that's better. In some way, uh, in the end, God is going to make this okay. Um, I do want to say God is working with it to try to squeeze whatever good can come from it. But that's different than saying that it's a part of some plan that God foreknows. 
one of the big differences between John and I is whether or not the future is known by God. And he thinks God knows the future exhaustively. I don't think God does. So in this particular case, he can say, well, God knew that it was going to happen from all eternity, and he knows how everything's going to eventually work out. So he can appeal to that. I don't think that's a good way to go for a number of reasons, but I just want to note in closing that this is one of the big differences between John's view <clears throat> of how God knows and my view of how God knows. Can I say one thing about that, Justin, before yeah, we close? Yeah, please do. Yep. <clears throat> um, I think I agree that we shouldn't appeal to mystery too quickly, and my account doesn't appeal, appeal to mystery alone, but just recognizes that at some point we don't know exactly why God is doing what he's doing why he's not, which I think is true of Tom's account as well. But when it comes to foreknowledge, I think uh, the idea that if God knew in advance, that somehow is a disadvantage. I don't think that's true, because if God knows in advance, that means that the things he's commanding, the things he's doing, he knows with certainty are going to be the most preferable given all the factors. On an open theist account like Tom's, uh, I don't see how there's any advantage because God would know, uh, just by having present knowledge, God would know everything he would need to know to prevent any kind of evil just before it happens, if he has the kind of power that the God of the Bible has. So in the case of this very tragic, the most recent crash, and in other cases, God would know everything he would need to know a millisecond before a particular evil, and then could intervene. So if God has good reasons for not intervening a millisecond before, those same good well, reasons count if God foreknows from eternity. Well, we, we, we'll, we'll have to leave the conversation now. I appreciate it could go on. Um, but I've appreciated the way you've both engaged each other on the program today. Uh, for what are ultimately not just theological games, but important issues that many many people struggle with on a daily basis that reconciling uh, the god of love and the fact of an evil world so um, i appreciate both of you coming on to explain your different perspectives i'll make sure there are links uh, thomasjord.com for more about uh, tom's books and uh, his uh, god can't book um, and john peckham uh, he's with bakerpublishinggroup.com if you want to find his book there and you can find him online as well as i say links from today's show over at premierchristianradio.com forward slash unbelievable but for now uh, tom and john thank you very much for being with me for more conversations between christians and skeptics subscribe to the unbelievable podcast and for more updates and bonus content sign up to the unbelievable newsletter